You heard a little bit about the, about the study. And one of the things that I'll say at the outset is this is a rapidly changing field. Um, more than 75% of everything in the peer-reviewed academic literature that's been written about hydraulic fracturing has been written in the last 18 months. It's an exponential increase in the amount of, in the amount of information. Um, so from, a, from the standpoint of trying to just, just, just trying to review what's out there, it's, uh, it's a daily changing challenge. Um, uh, but uh, Stephen, who you'll hear from later, and the rest of our team have, have done our best to try to get a handle on uh, what's out there in that research. And a lot of it, although there's a lot of it out there and, and more emerging, a lot of it is cross-referencing uh, each other, and there isn't always a lot of uh, new material. But I'll try to cover some of the major issues as we go through here. A few comments about my background. Um, it, my background is in environmental science. I'm interested in, in resilience of, of social ecological systems. And uh, I'm in a named chair. Talisman is, uh, is an oil and gas company. And in an age where uh, there's more and more corporate sponsorship, I, I mean, I think we're, we're sitting in the Civic Center here. I think until recently it was the Pepsi Center. Uh, probably did, doesn't prevent any of you from drinking Coke or water or, or something else. And the, and the talisman energy chair part of this for me is something I looked at very carefully before I, before I took on, uh, on the role. And I have to say that, uh, uh, frankly, being in an industry-sponsored chair has given me more freedom than having federally funded research grants. There's actually more flexibility and a greater ease in, in being able to talk about our research findings uh, than I found with, uh, with provincial and certainly with, with federal dollars. So it's put me in an interesting position, and I can honestly say that the energy industry has been completely open to our findings and, uh, and very interested in, um, in, in, in best practice if we can come up with something that helps them uh, to do a better job. I'm not a petroleum engineer or a, or a geologist. I'll try to speak to some of the technical issues as I go through, but my background is more in environmental science. We've had a, a fairly diverse team, and I'll try to represent their findings as best I can as we go on here, but I may have to duck if it gets, uh, if it gets uh, too much into some of the engineering. The other thing I want to say at the outset is that although we're here to talk about a particular technique, a particular way to produce energy, um, I think this is all part of a larger discussion that we need to be having about our energy future. What do we want that energy mix to look like in the, in the long term? And sometimes we can get focused on one particular uh, debate, and I think we also have to step back and say, well, what is the mix? How do we, how do we transition to a lower carbon economy? We know we have to do that. Um, this may be a step. Uh, methane may be a transitional fuel, although there's a fair amount of debate about that. If some of the estimates of methane leakage, for example, are true, uh, we may be producing more greenhouse gases with, um, with methane production than we are with burning coal. So we have to be, we have to be careful. Um, and then the other thing I want to say at the outset is that I'll be talking about, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be calling this fracking as, as I go through the presentation, but I'm not just talking about the well completion stage which is about a two-day process where the actual frack happens. I'm going to be talking about a cradle-to-grave kind of approach, right from exploration through to putting a well to bed uh, when, it's finished, um, when it's finished producing hydrocarbons. And then um, just a note, too, that uh, related to our energy futures, I'm not going to say a lot about this, but I encourage you to, to, to if you're interested, to take a look at, the, at this notion of planetary boundaries. And folks are looking at these things from a, from a global scale now. And it's clear that we've exceeded um, some pretty important planetary boundary systems. And so thinking about hydrocarbon productions is all part of this. The other thing that I'll just ma mention in passing at the outset here is that we're really talking about risk management. We make decisions and trade-offs on a day-to-day -day basis about risk. And basically what you need to think about when you're thinking about risk is how likely is it that something is going to occur, uh, which is on the uh, horizontal axis, a uh, vertical axis here, and then how significant is a possible negative outcome. So if something is likely to occur and is likely to give you a bad outcome, then that's probably not something you want to do. If something is uh, very likely or not very likely to occur, um, but it carries with it a, a, a high risk, then it's something you really want to think about. You can start to quantify these things. We can work out mathematical probabilities of things, these things happening. And one of the things that our research has been focused on is where do we actually sit with respect to hydraulic fracturing in terms of, uh, in terms of this kind of a chart? Why are we even talking about this? 
the history of natural resources is really one of accessing low-hanging fruit first. We get the things that are easy, uh, the things that where we can make the most money uh, in, the, in, the, in the short term. And as we reach higher and higher up those systems, we deplete what we originally started looking at. So hydraulic fracturing starts to get at resources that were until very recently just not econ economical to access. We didn't have the technology and they were too expensive for us to get at. And this is the reason why. Um, and again, I was told that, that, um, that you probably already know a lot about hydraulic fracturing and why we're talking about this. So I'll skip over a lot of this fairly quickly and if people have questions at the end, we can come back to it. But basically we're talking about resources out here where the spaces in the rock are very, very small, and those spaces hold on to those hard hydrocarbons very tight. Uh, when there's lots of space in rock, in conventional oil and gas, you can, you can literally stick a straw down into this stuff, like a milkshake, and suck it out. This is like a really, really thick milkshake, and if you stick your straw down into this stuff, not much of it's going to come up uh, into the straw. It's just really, really small um, pore spaces that, that we're talking about. And so the fracturing opens up some of those spaces, allows that hydrocarbon to, to flow to the straw, and you're able to remove it. So we're talking about what's, um, what's conventionally called uh, tight resources. And that just means that the rocks hold the resource uh, tight. Lots of what you'll hear about in the media talks about shale gas, but it's a lot more than just gas. We're talking about uh, oil as well. And in fact, the Greenpoint shales of Western Newfoundland here, these complex shales that are close to home for you, uh, probably contain shale oils, as well as what are called gas liquids. So, so uh, propanes, butanes, pentanes, these are the liquid parts of, of gas. And that's the stuff right now, especially where, when oil and gas prices are where they're at, that's where you make your money. Uh, dry gas um, right now is not a very economic thing to produce, but if you can produce oil and you can produce some of these gas liquids along with your methane then you're likely to have a more economical play. So although the media talks a lot about shale gas we're talking about a complex mix of things that it's not just gas and not just in shale but it's all of these hydrocarbons and they're and they're tightly uh, tightly held. Fracking itself is not new. Fracking has been used in the oil and gas industry um, for almost 70 years. Uh, some of the first fracks happened in the, in the U.S. In, in Kansas. They used to use um, uh, napalm as a, as, a, as a fracking fluid. They mixed uh, sand and napalm and put it down a hole and stood back. <laughs> um, and, it, and, it, and it cracked the rock fairly, fairly close to the surface because, again, they were accessing more of the conventional hydrocarbons. What's new to the story today is that we're talking about holes that are really deep, that have a horizontal leg to them, and that fracture in multiple stages. And so by really deep, we're talking 2,000 to 3,000 meters straight down. Um, and then you can go out with a lateral. Right now, you can go out about five kilometers. So when you go out five kilometers, think of it, um, I'll switch from milkshake to thinking about a layer cake. And it's like putting a straw, if you just put a straw into a layer cake, right into the good stuff that was in the middle, and sucked on that straw, you'd get a little bit out, but you'd sort of just empty out a little spot in the middle of that cake. But if you could put in one of those bendy straws down into that cake and go right through that stuff in the middle, then you'd be able to, you've got a lot more surface area interaction uh, and you're able to remove that. And that's, that's what's changed hydraulic fracturing uh, today. It's the ability to go horizontal because we have the technology, the industry has the technology to do that now. Um, and, then, uh, and then the fracturing part of it that we'll get to in the next slide um, is also a, a, a game changer. I don't expect you to be able to see all of the stuff in this slide. And again, I'm assuming that most people have a sense of, uh, of what's going on here. But you drill, a hole, you drill a hole down, you go horizontal. Once you've got that horizontal leg in place, you open up holes in the pipe. You then pump sand and water and a mixture of other chemicals down there at very high pressure. It goes up and down from that pipe opens up the crack in the rocks and then allows the hydrocarbons to flow to that pipe and back up uh, to the surface. All of that happens within a, a metal pipe and then near the surface there's a series of, uh, of, of casings. Uh, there's a layer of uh, five different casings uh, that isolate what you're trying to remove from the, uh, from the earth to the layers close to the surface of the, of the earth. And at the very top uh, you, what you want to do is make sure that you're completely isolated from any, from any groundwater connection. So you use pipe, 
with a, then with a layer of uh, cement and epoxy, and then another layer of pipe and another layer of uh, cement and epoxy. And then the other thing that's, that we're talking about here is that we're this, is, um, this is the kind of depth that we're talking about. And usually these layers of shale or, or sand that the industry is trying to access are isolated by at least 2,000 meters from any surface water, at least where they're doing the fracturing. Obviously, this stuff has to come back up this pipe, and there's potential for interaction in this zone, um, but that's what those layers of, um, of cement and, and uh, metal casing are for. This is big business across, uh, across North America. You've probably seen images like this one that point out just how much this is going on across the, across the landscape. Um, you can see it forms a big U all the way through uh, North America. Up and down the western sedimentary basin here, the, the Canadian Rockies, down all the way into the Gulf Coast in Texas, and then back up to where we are, uh, where, we're, where we're sitting tonight. Uh, these are big plays, and they've changed uh, incredibly rapidly over the last decade. The landscape footprint of this can be extremely significant. It looks a little different than this today. Again, not only is the literature changing about on this, but the practice is changing. This is an image from Texas that was taken five years ago, and all whoops, and all of those um, all of those little gray areas are well sites on the surface. Now, what they're trying to do with hydraulic fracturing, because you can go horizontally, is put four, five, six, seven, eight wells on one well pad, and so you can you can erase. Um, five or six of those well pads uh, for, for every one that you want to drill on now. But it still has a, a significant impact on the surface landscape. Just to give you a sense of how fast this has changed, um, this horizontal, multi-stage horizontal fracturing really started in a big way in the Barnett Shales in Texas. And in 2004, there were 40 wells in the Barnett Shales. And in 2010, there were over 10,000 wells in the Barnett Shales. This has driven this whole push for U.S. Uh, energy independence. And U.S. gas production increased 660% from 2007 to 2013. So we're talking about a massive change in the oil and gas landscape across North America. There are now over 1 million fractured wells uh, in North America, about 200,000 of them in Canada. This is just the gas side of things. Again, with these shales that are that are close to home for you, you've got uh, you've got gas. You probably also have have uh, oil and uh, and some of these gas liquids. But if we just look at the gas side, these 2013 numbers, which are already uh, out of date, um, they're all. When I look at big numbers, they're just they're just big numbers. <laughs> um, but basically, what these numbers tell us is that at current rates of consumption. The amount of shale gas that's been identified in the Canadian landscape is enough for about a 125-year supply of natural gas. That's a, uh, that's, a lot of, uh, that's a lot of gas. And in fact, the numbers are somewhat out of date because the new reserves they've discovered now in northern Alberta and northern BC um, increase these numbers by about another 20% or so. So it's, it's, it, it's big business. Most of it is in the west. Um, this is the western Canadian sedimentary basin up and down the eastern slopes. A uh, little over 25,000 um, is the number here. Um, you can see here the, uh, the offshore and near shore on the east coast is signif significantly less, uh, but still in the economic, uh, potentially in the economic range for, for development. So what are the big concerns around hydraulic fracturing? I'll try to touch on each of the things on that list uh, really briefly here. The first one is water. Um, you need to use some sort of a fluid to do the frack. So when you drill that hole, what opens up the cracks in the rock is high pressure fluid. The fluid of choice is water. And the cheap, remember that uh, low hanging fruit sl slide, the cheapest and most readily available source of water has been surface fresh water. That's what the industry has, has mostly used. They pump that water down there at high pressure, mix it with sand, the, the water opens up the cracks, the, sands hold, the sand holds the cracks open, and we'll get to the additives in a, in a couple minutes. Each well needs about 3,500 to 15,000 cubic meters of water. And again, those are just, what's that? What's a cubic meter of water? Uh, the average Canadian household uses about 84 cubic meters of water per year. So we're talking about a lot of water per well. Uh, but compared to other industries, 
You know, the average Albertan irrigator uses about 216,000 cubic meters of water a year to irrigate, uh, and the oil and gas industry currently uses um, less than one tenth of a percent of, uh, of, of all water withdrawals in Canada. So the industry in general isn't a big water user, but when you look at an individual well and its potential impact at a particular point on the surface of the earth, it could be significant. Especially in, these, the red in this air, on this map, it's a recent report by the World Resources Institute and it shows areas of high water stress. So southern Alberta here is an area where there's a lot of hydraulic fracturing but not a lot of surface water. Lots of discussion about what's in that stuff that they, that they pump underground. It's roughly 98, 99% water, either fresh water or, or, or salt water that I'll talk about in a, in a couple minutes, and sand. Um, but there's a mix of chemicals in there. They use a, a, an acid. Uh, an acid is used to clean the, clean the pipes. It's also used to, um, uh, to potentially dissolve minerals to help in those, in open those, those cracks. There's iron control agents. Uh, corrosion inhibitors to keep the pipes uh, safe. Again, friction, you've probably heard the term slick water fracturing. You put something in the water to make it more slippery. So remember, you're pumping stuff um, seven kilometers with sand in it. You want something that's, that's got a slippery in, slipperiness to it that's going to that's gonna flow. And then the, the probably the biggest concern from a human standpoint and a life standpoint is are these biocides. And these are usually antibacterial. Uh, antimicrobial agents, and they do what they what they sound like. They kill things that are that are uh, that are alive, um, and that stuff. Not only do you send it back underground, but you bring it back up to the surface after you're finished with the frack, and that's the stuff that has people concerned. So, um, probably the lowest risk, and one of the reasons why I'm talking about the full life cycle of hydraulic fracturing is the actual frack is probably the lowest probability accident part of the whole equation, at least from the research we've done. Some of the probabilities have been estimated that there's a 1 in 200 million chance that a, that a, that a deep hydraulic fracture is actually going to come in contact with any, any surface water. This is different than, I'm not talking about coal bed methane, and that it, there's no coal bed methane uh, development kind of being discussed around here. There is some uh, further rest, west, but with this deep multi-stage hydraulic fracturing, the actual frack is probably not the biggest area of concern from a water contamination standpoint. The bigger risks are really what happens when this stuff gets back up to the surface and the potential for, for human error. And it's just the same as spilling any kind of a toxic chemical near the surface. It's people handling equipment, potential for equipment failure, potential for uh, containers that hold this stuff on the surface um, to break. What mostly concerns people, and you've probably seen this in some of the literature you're looking at, is BTEX. BTEX stands for benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene. You don't have to be a chemist to be worried about some of those, some of those chemicals. Those are, all, um, those are all detrimental chemicals to the human nervous system uh, and other living things, nervous systems. About one-third, someone did a, a study last year in the U.S., and about one-third of the 190 additives that they looked at in fracking fluid didn't have good biological toxicity information associated with them. We just don't know how dangerous some of these chemicals currently are. Um, what do you do in this? So you pump all this water underground, you put those chemicals in it, it then comes back up to the surface. You now have new things. You have everything that you put down there to start with, but now you've got new things coming back up because you're picking up um, saline water, you're picking up radioactivity, you're picking up potentially heavy metals, and now you're bringing all that stuff back up to the surface, and now you have to do something with it. You either treat it through some sort of a water treatment system, and the industry is um, developing new treatment systems, um, or in a lot of places, they're putting another hole in the ground somewhere else, and they're pumping it back down underground. A couple other concerns. One is long-term long um, wellbore integrity. So when you put this hole into the ground, and it's, I showed you all of the metal and, and cement casing part of that, over time, there's a potential for that to degrade. Uh, for the cement to break down, if we're talking about some earthquakes associated with some of these, you can potentially get breakage in some of that cement or, um, or even in the metal. And then finally, what the industry calls communication, and that's just where you're doing your fracking, there may be some existing faults in the, in the local geology, and you could get a connection between what you're creating with, hydro with your fracks and existing, existing faults. 
And way back at the beginning, I had a picture of the geology close to here, and you're sitting on some really complex geology. In fact, uh, a lot of it hasn't been fully mapped uh, for, this re for this region. Um, but one of the things to keep an eye on is going to be those existing fractures, those naturally occurring fractures in the geology uh, close to shore here. So one of the things that the industry has done uh, in, because of public concern is they've started to disclose everything that they're using in, in fracking fluids. So in Alberta and in, in BC and in New Brunswick, when they, were, when they were flirting with this a little bit, they started looking at um, reporting. And if you want to actually go and look at some of this information directly yourself, there's a website called Frack Focus. And I've taken a screenshot here. This is, uh, I live in the middle of this right here. And uh, all of those circles um, are areas where there's hydraulic fracturing. Those numbers are the numbers of wells that are in each of those circles. So I'm surrounded by this stuff um, where I live. So you can go to a map, um, frac focus, search by map, or you can search by legal land description. And then you can click on one of those wells. And again, I don't expect you to see this. I'm just showing you what you can look for. Um, you can look up all of the chemicals they used in that hydraulic fracturing fluid. The industry is still allowed to put trade secret in one of those columns. Um, they have to indicate why it's a trade secret and whether you should be worried about it or not. Um, but the move is to try to identify all the chemicals that are in those, um, those hydraulic fracturing fluids. The other thing that's emerging, and I think it's really important to be aware of from a public standpoint, if you're going to be living close to this stuff, is there are emerging green fluid technologies. They don't have to be using, for example, those BTEX biocides in all applications. And uh, there, there's a, something called the Green Chemistry Institute Hydraulic Fracturing Roundtable in the US. And they're working with some of the biggest uh, companies like Anadarko and Schlumberger and, um, uh, oh, I'm blocking on the, what's Dick Cheney's other one? Um, Halliburton, um, uh, to develop these new green fracking, uh, fracking alternatives. So we can be pushing, um, to not have some of those things that we don't want to see in hydraulic, or at least the higher risk parts of those hydraulic fracking fluids. There are, all, are alternatives emerging um, to some of those. Uh, this is a, a ranch that uh, actually Stephen and I were on uh, just a couple months ago. This is just outside of Calgary, and, uh, and landowners are seeing health effects in their, in their herd animals. It's hard to draw a direct connection between the hydraulic fracturing that you saw on that previous slide, all of those circles, and herd health, there's a lot of other things going on in that landscape, um, but there seems to be a connection between when this stuff started happening and when these health uh, issues started showing up in the cat in the cattle. It's it's created a push for much more monitoring. The the uh, University of Calgary Vet School is now doing uh, complex airshed uh, monitoring in here. The oil and gas company didn't companies didn't do it ahead of when they uh, did the hydraulic fracturing. They did well testing, but not uh, air testing. Um, and I think that was a critical lesson learned, is that we need to be doing baseline, detailed baseline monitoring before, during, and after. So citizens are starting to, uh, to, to try to stand up uh, uh, for what they believe are their, are their rights as, as landowners, sometimes in small basements like this where the local ranchers are, are gathering near Calgary and we visited them to hear their story as part of our study. Uh, or sometimes in much bigger, more organized uh, ways. Uh, New York State is probably the poster child for anti-fracking uh, protest. Yoko Ono and her son held a national song, anti-fracking song writing competition. Uh, the New York Health, uh, New York State Health Department issued a, a report recently that was the major piece of information that resulted in the gover governor of New York instituting a hydraulic fracturing ban. And basically what they said was that there just wasn't clear enough information uh, to make them comfortable going forward from a human health standpoint. So there is emerging evidence of human health uh, and, uh, and animal issues. Don't have time to go through all this stuff, um, but if you, if, if you are interested, the, the report of the New York State um, Health Department is a, is a good one. Uh, there's another organization of, of concerned scientists in the U.S., and they currently keep a compendium of every fracking study uh, ever conducted, and they do a short uh, summary of, of, uh, of, of every one. Um, and then there's a recent book out called The Real, Real Cost of Fracking that looks at uh, some of the stories that are emerging around public health. And 
without getting into, again, all the details there, one of the things that's really challenging is often individual landowners sign non-disclosure agreements. So the company puts a well on their, on their property, the person gets paid to have that, that, that well there, uh, and they sign a piece of paper saying that if anything happens, they can't talk about it. And in my part of the country, a lot of those uh, non-disclosure agreements are actually registered against title. So if I were to buy a property from someone who had one of these, uh, uh, something happen on their land, I would inherit that and I would not be able to talk about it, uh, talk about it either. So there's some real challenges and that part of it just doesn't seem uh, right. If we're talking about full disclosure on one end and then we're talking about these non-disclosure agreements. Maybe there can be non-disclosure around the economics. If that's a, you know, if there's an agreement between a landowner and an oil and gas company about how much money they get paid, maybe that part of it's personal. But uh, one of the things that our study points out is that non-disclosure around environmental damage shouldn't be part of the overall picture here. Air emissions, this is one of the hardest things to get a handle on. This is the area where there's least amount of current scientific information. Um, when you bring all of that stuff back up to the surface, uh, you want to capture the stuff that's marketable, uh, but sometimes it's hard to separate from the stuff that's not marketable, and then there's just waste material that comes to the surface as well, and, uh, and companies burn it uh, or vent it, and the technology has improved greatly over the last decade, but you're still burning um, and you have the potential to put things like that, that you know, BTEX uh, back into the atmosphere and it settles out somewhere else on the landscape. So it's, it's one of the ones that we identified as probably one of the most challenging uh, and least known parts of the overall picture here and requires a lot more monitoring and information. Last thing I'm going to talk about is landscape and cumulative effects. This is all of the stuff that happens on the surface. It's everything associated with doing hydraulic fracturing. You have to explore the landscape. You have to build well pads, roads, pipelines, transmission lines, and all of that stuff has a physical footprint on the landscape. As I mentioned earlier, this type of technology probably has overall a lower footprint than conventional oil and gas, but it's still significant. How significant? It depends on what else is going on in your landscape and what you want from those landscapes. If it's a landscape outside of an, if it's a buffer area outside of a national park, that's a lot different than if it's in a um, in a hinterland where um, where you're where you're maybe less concerned about uh, overall landscape footprint. This part of it requires understanding what we really want from our landscapes in the long term. It requires strategic land use planning and understanding trade-offs. Um, if we want activity A, then we might get less of, uh, of activity B. And for the most part, oil and gas development uh, in Canada doesn't happen as part of a land use planning process. Usually it's completely separate from land use planning departments and, uh, and oil and gas, especially in the West, really trumps most other land, uh, land uses. And so if we want to get a handle on some of these overall cumulative landscape effects, it needs to be part of the bigger land use planning picture. We did some modeling as part of this research. We did some modeling just to demonstrate uh, changes in the landscape. Um, all you need to take away from this image is as it gets more red, it's more impact. And what this shows is that the, the footprint from human activity for doing this kind of activity goes from about 1,000 kilometers, 1,000 square kilometers to 3,000 square kilometers in 30 years. Uh, this is the eastern slopes of, uh, of Alberta. And one of the things that's important is that it's not just that number, it's not just going from 1,000 to 3,000 square kilometers. That 3,000 square kilometers isn't in one nice 3,000 square kilometer chunk. It's dispersed widely over the landscape and creates a lot of uh, edge, um, at what's called anthropogenic edge. So a lot of, a lot of roads, um, uh, a lot of linear disturbance that takes that 30,000, 3,000 square kilometers and spreads it across the landscape. So from an impact standpoint, it has a much greater overall landscape impact than if that 3,000 square kilometers uh, were, were all together. In Alberta, just as an example, um, there's enough road now in Alberta to go, out, to go around the equator 40 times, um, primarily due to oil and gas development. So I will stop there and turn it over to, uh, to Stephen and, and then hopefully answer any questions you might have uh, after he's finished. Thank you.
Turn on my mic. Ah, oh, it works. Did that work well? <laughs> it was actually my mic before that uh, I think caused the problem when you were up here. So, so I apologize for that. I don't know if it's me or whether it's whether it's, it's the mic. Um, it's Mike, yeah, uh, yeah. So I, I'm very pleased and, and honored to have the opportunity uh, to speak with you, and I want to thank uh, the Harris Center and want to thank everybody for coming and sharing this kind of public space. Um, I'm an academic uh, who has a prejudice or a bias. I'm a policy wonk. Uh, fracking is is new to me. In fact, sometimes I'm reluctant to call it fracking because when I'm in the United States, they said you shouldn't call it fracking. You should call it shale gas production uh, or, or, or other things because fracking is, is too political. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about the politics and the I guess the policy side of this this issue, and provide you with a number of different ways of thinking about the issue, uh, and looking I guess to a certain extent at the at the bigger picture. One of the nice things about having Mike here is he's equivalent to having a clinician uh, who who's dealing with kind of the, some of the technical issues or, or questions. Um, I'll deal as, as best I can with, with some of the politics or or some of the policy implications, I think, associated with this. We actually have a, a huge report which is still being produced, and I'm dealing with, I guess, the, the impact, the role of regulations, and, and doing a kind of a comparative uh, piece in terms of looking at how others have dealt or have not dealt uh, with this, this particular uh, issue. Um, so I will not provide you the kind of slides and the, the, the kind of pictures and, and the, 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 again, the, the insights which, which Mike has offered, but I'll, I'll talk a bit about, I think, the, the politics uh, surrounding it. So we are dealing with um, knowledge gaps. We are dealing with, in many respects, the same thing that the Americans were dealing with. In fact, in terms of the larger context, the reason I think we're, we're dealing with these knowledge gaps is because the pressure comes from the United States. And, and I'll talk a bit about that. There, again, politically, um, this is on the agenda. And part of it has to do with, obviously, the issue of green energy within the United States. Um, when I was in the United States, I found out that hydro was not considered green in many of the states. It is in, in places like Vermont. Um, and again, so there's, there's a lot of political decision making involved. Um, but shale gas production um, is very important in the United States in terms of US foreign policy. And a clear objective is to get the Russians and to drive down the price and to impact upon their currency. So it's been, again, a very successful policy uh, in terms of achieving that outcome. So, we, so in terms of knowledge construction or knowledge brokering, we need to understand the different perspectives. Um, part of what we are doing uh, with the next, within the next couple of days is to understand the local culture and, and understand the perspective or the different perspectives of people who are, who are here, who, who have gathered. Fracking has not occurred. But there are concerns, I think, in terms of having some kind of conversation, some kind of discussion. But we, we need to understand, again, the larger context in terms of who's driving this and the different perspectives and, and, and what the issue is, how it's being perceived, and, and, and so on and so forth. So we are looking at um, the impact of fracking on surface water. There's another team that actually is looking at, at groundwater, but we're focusing primarily upon that, and we're doing this for the Canadian Water uh, Network. Um, so again, the critical question in terms of agenda setting, um, and I worked on a, on a, you talked earlier about the Romano Commission, or I worked with the Romano Commission, and most of us involved with the Romano Commission became involved with the CR, CIHR project, which is dealing with kind of post-Romano, and we were looking at agenda setting in terms of healthcare reform, so we were looking at the three I's, the, the ideas, the interests, the, the institutions which shape or influence whether a particular uh, reform was introduced or, or, or put into, into practice in different jurisdictions. So we're, so we're looking at, again, the, the kind of the, the factors and forces which are driving agenda setting. But the other side of public policy, of course, is implementation. So part of the question that has to do with agenda setting in terms of how does this or why does this appear in the radar screen in some jurisdictions and other, other jurisdictions, but there are also, of course, questions in terms of implementation. If you actually have regulations, there are costs involved. You have to build the, the skill sets. You have to train the people. You have to put into place all the things in terms of the reporting. You have to have a baseline. Um, and there may be a reluctance to do that. So again, we need to understand or recognize that there are 
different types of gaps associated with having, having a particular policy um, and making decisions in terms of whether you're actually going to pass legislation or, or spend time talking about legislation. Or establishing, again, training the people, that, creating the competencies, the skill sets which are associated. Again, politics is about resources. It's about making decisions about scarce resources. So fracking is, again, is part of that larger uh, conversations. So again, knowledge gaps. Why these knowledge gaps? Um, in the United States, part of the explanation, I think, has to do with the sense that they have to increase their sphere of influence internationally. That this is a way of inc making America strong. Um, teaching the Poles how to frack so you can reduce the dependency uh, so that the Russians are, are undermined and putting the kind of the bear uh, in, in, in chains. Um, domestically, again, there's the, there are concerns about, as you said, coal and, and, and the kind of the impacts in terms of that, that footprint. Um, there may be questions in terms of whether in, in actuality the methane challenges the problems with fracking are actually going to improve um, you know, that, that situation. But there is, this, I think, the sense of the United States, part of the problem of trying to sell it outside of the United States, um, which requires gaining legitimacy. And part of that has to do with convincing their own domestic kind of communities um, that is within their, their own interests. So you have to kind of create or construct um, evidence. You have to put back in place many of the institutions which have actually been, you know, been, been cut down or have, have been hollowed out or have been demonized. So there's this, I think, the sense in the United States that regulations may actually have to come back into, into, into you know, the, the mainstream. Um, that they're part of the challenge or problem is there are very few public spaces um, that we've, we've kind of, you know, we've, we've, we've undermined the power of, you know, bureaucracy. We've, 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 we've undermined, demonized ex experts. And now there's this kind of sense that we need to somehow uh, rethink some of these things because social movements are much more um, difficult to manage than our communities which are operating within these, these, these larger networks. So again, there is this, I think, a need to understand um, the domestic context. We also need to understand the differences across different states or different provinces. You know, the situation in New Brunswick was quite different than it was here. Um, situation here in Quebec, it doesn't make sense to, you know, to generate that form of energy because it competes with hydro. Um, so again, we need to understand the kind of the context. We need to understand the domestic uh, circumstances, but we also un understand the external factors of forces which are driving this interest or this push. And again, the push is significant. This is a game changer within the United States. We see a huge increase in terms of energy production coming from that particular sector. Um, and again, my, my challenge was how do we miss that in Newfoundland and Labrador from 2007, 2014, which is the era we're talking about hydro, which is connected with province building, how do we miss that? We, so again, we need to understand the larger context in terms of what, what are the, you know, the, 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 the impacts, what, what are the outcomes, and the fact that there, there's a struggle which, which, is, which, is, which is taking place. Um, regulations, processes, um, to a certain extent, kind of legitimize um, certain forms of, of behavior. Um, and so again, I think understanding this, this issue in part has to understand this kind of larger um, kind of context. Um, we also need to understand that decision making or policy decision making is partly technical, it's, it's partly um, political. It's a combination. Ultimately, what the experts say this is a good or bad thing um, is relevant, is significant, is important, but ultimately in the end, it's the politicians who are, who are accountable. And again, in terms of this fracking issue, it's been a, a very difficult um, kind of struggle. Um, who is producing information? What kind of information? Again, there's, a, there's kind of this, this sense of, of, of lack of trust. And there's a, and it's a very kind of difficult balance some, sometimes uh, to, to maintain. The other thing is that if you're looking at the issue of, say, water governance within, within the country, or you're looking at the different sectors, the energy sectors which are competing for influence or power, um, it's complicated. You know, they're not normally located in the same place. There aren't places to, you know, there aren't public spaces where we can bring these various interests together to interact, to come up with common solutions or ideas, or even understanding what, what the other sectors are doing. There's a lot of competition, and, and there's a need to somehow um, reflect upon that. And I think part of the challenge within Canada, as well as the United States, is that we have all these competing silos, and increasingly over time, because of the hollowing out of the state and the, and the deregulation, um, and the kind of the, this kind of the shift in terms of the narrative that 
the institutions are incapable of managing or controlling behavior of bureaucrats, to a certain extent, we've, we've kind of abandoned that. But now we're, we're, we're now at a point where we're, we're again, parting to, starting to, to, to rethink it. Um, the idea of, of social license. Um, social license is something which, as we talked about this in, in Calgary, has emerged in places like Canada and Australia. And it's even being thought by those on the right who would normally not think about these kinds of things. But there's a sense among companies that they need to get more buy-in. Um, that they need to legitimize, they need to actually to, to kind of reinvent uh, because they, they've actually hollowed out uh, the way things used to be organized and there's a, a sense of kind of bringing this, this back. Um, so there is, a, again, a challenge or problem in terms of understanding the larger piece in terms of the politics, in terms of understanding the kind of the policy context and some of the challenges in terms of um, working together bringing you know, people together back so they can have these common you know, discussions, to have a, even if they, if they have different perspectives, to actually to come up with a common sense of what the problems are, what the challenges are, what they want to buy into, what they think is a good idea, what kind of investments are, are required and necessary. Um, and again, I, I think that there is a, a challenge going forward because of we, we have hollowed it. We have, we have raised some of these concerns and, and some of these, these considerations. Uh, shale gas production is highly controversial in part because it occurred too quickly. It is, it is a game changer. It is, it is being driven by a number of very powerful uh, forces. Um, part of the problem had to do with the underlying political economy. Um, the mom and pops organizations, the first ones that were into fracking, were not paying that close attention to the impacts or the outcomes because they're in and they're out. It's kind of like you know, history in terms of the forest sector. That, you know, when there isn't really a, you know, a, a long-term commitment to a community and the bankers are basically saying the bottom line is even if there were regulations, there, wa there wasn't really much uh, you know, attention being paid to that. So part of the problem had to do with actually the, the, the industry itself and, 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 and some of the, the, the memories or, or some of the concerns people have had, real concerns in terms of, in terms of, some, of the, some of the outcomes associated with, 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 with some of those, those industries. Um, it's also, I think, important, I talked about the significance of the U.S. foreign policy. Um, in terms of achieving that objective, I think that they've, they've, they've been very successful. Um, it is, a, again, there's a number of, of different perspectives when, when it comes to identifying or filling some of those gaps which, which we've, we've, we've identified. So again, we do have weak institutions. We have you know, silo-based decision making. We have parliaments um, which no longer really have uh, the same kind of role that they did in the past. We have a, a system of intergovernmental relations where we have accords where they're not actually debated within parliament. Uh, you can't even contest them within the courts because they are political, uh, you know, agreements. They're, they're not. They're not legal rules. So again, I, I think there's a sense that there's a, a, a disconnect. There's a there's a lack of trust. Um, there's there's a there's a suspicion um, of institutions. There is an understanding that these institutions are, are are breaking down. That there are no you know there are fewer public spaces to engage to have these kinds of debates to talk about whether it's it's a, you know it's it's the right approach or or not. And again, I think what shale gas production has, is doing is that it is forcing a rethink. Um, those who are in positions of power who think that it's important in order to achieve certain outcomes, whether they are uh, you know, replacing coal or whether they're driving economic development or whether they're having to do with you know, increasing the, the role of, of you know, or increasing the power of the US uh, internationally. Um, again, part of the challenge, I think, is in dealing with the the realities of weak institutions, the lack of public space, the lack of social license, the challenges connected with social movements of people who are frustrated for, for good reason. Um, and I think that's, that's very much part of understanding how do we create or construct knowledge differently? How do we create faith in institutions? How do we reinvent um, you know, some of the things which we, which we have trashed? And I think uh, shale gas production um, is really just one area of public policy where we're seeing some of the challenges which are, which are, which are connected um, with that. Um, in terms of the, again, the, the, the regulatory um, you know, connections and some of the challenges, new public management, which I haven't got a great deal of time to talk about, but new public management was a different narrative, a narrative which emerged and become, became very popular in the 1990s, the idea that institutions were incapable of controlling behavior particularly the behavior of experts or governments or, or, or bureaucrats. And so we, we hollowed it out, uh, we deregulated, 
we, we created you know, intergovernmental patterns of, of kind of relations which were based on political courts as opposed to rule of law. We've, we've gutted the power of, of, of the cabinet. We've done a lot of things to transform or change decision making. And, and I think that there are problems now because there's a lack of faith. There's a lack of, of legitimacy. There's a, again, there's an attempt to kind of to put this to bed very quickly. And, and I think that's why, in many respects, uh, we're struggling. There's a sense, Mike and I were talking earlier, about the sense that social movements are much more difficult to control, that they need to, again, somehow change that, 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 that focus in order to in, improve um, you know, and, and make it possible to, to, to address some of these, these issues or, or, or problems. Um, in Canada, um, we have a highly competitive decentralized federal system, and there are competing agendas. Um, province building in many provinces is connected with hydro. Um, you know, they're, they're competing energy sectors and, and, it, and it's difficult to basically to have a, a common conversation. There's certainly no national policy. In terms of the, the, my research, the federal government um, has been very reluctant to engage, to involve themselves both within the energy sectors as well as with, within the environment. Um, so it is a, again, it's a, it's a problem in terms of how do you, how do you regulate or, 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 or who regulates. Um, Alberta and British Columbia have done more than anyone else for you know, a variety of reasons. It, obviously, Alberta is very much connected to the oil and gas. It's easier within in places like Alberta, British Columbia, because there also, there's also a culture. There's a cultural landscape. There is a familiarity with, with industry and, and oil and gas. Um, in Alberta, what they have is kind of a one shot, you know, a one, one window approach to unconventional oil and gas. Uh, Alberta and British Columbia are really the, the provinces which have gone further than anyone else in actually looking at unconventional oil and gas or shale gas production and having it regulated um, in, in a different space to, to deal specifically with that, some of the issues or challenges associated with that. So in Alberta, um, they've integrated it. all the, again, all the kind of the various aspects in terms of regulation, um, it all, it's all in one house. Um, and that, in, in many respects, has, has I think, uh, made it easier. Uh, part of the challenge, of course, is that there, there is this kind of play-based policy, this, which is a, a pilot project, um, but it's, it's an attempt to try to go region by region because the geology is different, the, the, the cultural you know, landscape is, is different. Um, but it's an experiment as, as such. So if people are looking for and interested in fracking or in terms of regulations or the regulatory piece, Alberta um, and British Columbia are the models that, that people are paying the closest attention to. When I was in New Brunswick, for example, uh, there was in New Brunswick much interest in British Columbia as, as well as within Alberta. So those are the models if you actually want to do it. Of course, once you invest and, and, and put your resources and train the people required in terms of implementing, um, obviously you're, you're, you're buying into it. That, that, you're, that, that, that you, you think that that is a, a priority or that that is a important in terms of your, your, your community. But again, there, there, there are differences across um, different states as well as different provinces in terms of this, uh, this approach. Again, Alberta uh, has, uh, again, the, this integrated approach. Al uh, the British Columbia situation is, is, again, similar, but they've created the Crown Corporation, this oil and gas uh, commission. And again, many of the things in terms of reporting, in terms of highlighting or understanding where activities are, are occurring, reporting in terms of the, the, the materials which are being used and so on and so forth are all, again, uh, being put forward in British Columbia and Alberta, they're not in some of the other provinces which are tending to deal with fracking as, a, as if it was the, the, the conventional oil and gas. And, and I think if, if you're looking for uh, you know, provinces which are further ahead, I think those are, those are the two that one would, would want to uh, look at. Um, so we're living, you know, again, the biggest challenge or problem I think is, is the, the kind of the, the role of institutions or the role of, of regulations that, the, that fracking, um, is a, an attempt to very quickly to come to grips, to identify where are the knowledge gaps, where are the, the areas where we, we require or, or need um, you know, research, where do we need to put our resources. Um, it is a, a challenge, obviously, for those who are, who are opposed to it, uh, but those who are trying to you know, invigorate, to, to mobilize, to build the knowledge networks which are essential for this, this, you know, this, this restructuring to, to occur, um, they're fighting this, this battle of you know, silo-based approaches to decision-making, decentralized competition, and they're trying to create or reinvent some of the institutions which have been lost 
and to kind of to regain to gain the respect for for experts and, and for for some of the structures which have which have, have been changed and have been and demonized. Um, so again, it's it's not it's not easy putting things back um, once you deregulate, once you remove those knowledge networks um, and try to put them back into place very quickly. It's 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 been it's been a, a bit of a bit of a struggle. The same is true. Uh, in terms of the research, if you look at the research in terms of shale gas production or, or fracking, there wasn't very much in, in part because it came on so quickly. Um, but there's been acceleration and there's a lot more resources now going into to, to dealing with those issues or problems in order to sell it, in order to, in order to, to, to drive it or push it forward, which has as, as much to do with power um, as, as anything else. Um, so again, um, you know, the questions in terms of democratic deficit. Um, questions in terms of people want to have a voice. They want to raise concerns about what are the outcomes, what are the, the probabilities of, of having an earthquake, or what are the impacts likely to be if we're living in, in, a, in, in an area where we might have our, our wells polluted, and, and so on and so forth. So again, there's a, there's a, a, a kind of a, a sense that there are institutional deficiencies. I think those who are pushing for fracking or shale gas production or trying to deal with those institutional deficiencies, um, but at the same time they're having to deal with the challenges connected with social movements who are very concerned about the lack of their impact or their ability to actually shape or influence these institutions and, 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 and protect their, their, own, their, own, their own community uh, interests or, or, or the values which are important to those particular communities. So it's playing out very differently in, 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 in different Jurisdictions, but but certainly we're seeing, you know, an eruption of of of, of you know of, you know people who are, are mobilizing and, and concerned. In fact, I was saying earlier with with Mike that had we had a discussion here about democracy, you know, my department would have been talking about Bill 42, and and there has there was you know if we were here talking about democracy, um, I don't think there would be much of a crowd. There would be three or four people that would show up. If we talk about fracking. Even though we're not fracking here, people mobilize um, in part because there is a real sense that that is connected with being disconnected, or they're concerned about their water. Water matters, or, or the community health matters, and the, the outcomes associated with that matter. Um, and uh, again, there's this kind of sense that there is a power shift which is occurring. It may come from the United States. It may be coming from you know getting the Russians or what have you. And there may be outcomes which are which may be negative. Um, but we need to understand, the, again, the, the larger context. But we also I think, understand the impact or role of institutions or historical institutions, which in many respects we have collapsed or we've eliminated or, or we've demonized or we've decentralized. And we need to, we need to kind of to, 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 to come to grips uh, with, with that. Anyway, that is my, um, my, my overview. To kind of you know, come back in terms of the primary objective or purpose of, of our our, our piece is to provide you with kind of a, you know an understanding of the larger context and understanding the, again the, the impact of politics or the impact of, of policy decision making and again what I've tried to do is try to explain to the extent to which there is a larger um, kind of set of forces or factors which are shaping or influencing um, these outcomes and again part of the reason I think people are speaking out or frustrated is that they don't have public space. They don't have they don't have an opportunity to kind of to express themselves and and and, and their concerns. Um, but anyway, thank you for uh, for your time.
dialogue. Uh, public debate is not enough to provide expertise in the university. There's also a lot of expertise in the community. There's a lot of expertise in the community. So we really want to maximize the dialogue and the community. I think that this is a fantastic job. And we'd love to hear from Crystal and your experiences. If you want to make a statement, please do. Uh, we will bring it to a question so that we can have that dialogue. We have just William set up with a three-minute timer if he wins the Oscar. So uh, if he wins the Oscar, I would say you have three minutes to finish off that question. Uh, you won't turn on me. Uh, I'll start to I'll start dancing. <laughs> 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 uh, but uh, we want to encourage that dialogue. So I'll start with the front, then I'll go with my answers, and we'll go back and back and back. Bob Di <coughs> yeah, Bob Diamond from Stevensville. And uh, there is a movement taking place. There are, there are people on the west coast of Newfoundland who see what you're, you're saying, the deficiencies in the regulatory and the governance system. And we are trying to create space. We had an excellent forum uh, on the 1st of February. Of course, our detractors tried to say it was just a rally for uh, people who are already, you know, like fanatics or something or another. But I, you know, I was part of the organizing committee, and we had some credible scientists, an ecologist, an economist, and a, and a spiritual uh, leader, a uh, Mi'kmaq spiritual leader from from Newfoundland, and it was was pretty effective. But that's what we're dealing with. And, you know, we come from a place where over a little over a year ago, talking about a landscape in terms of what Mike was saying, we had a, a proposal for a hydraulic fracking operation on the tip of a shallow point that goes into the middle of a very productive marine ecosystem of the, of the Port of Port Bay, right on the tip. There's a gentleman out there, Andrew uh, Harvey from Bars Wallace. He says, because of climate change, that tip will probably won't be there in 10 years. Mm -hmm. So it's totally absurd. I mean, any thinking rational people to even consider an operation like that in such a sensitive place. So again, it, I know you can talk about, you know, your the different technologies and the the engineering aspects of it, but what's what's really important is place, and that place is just totally anybody with any logical mind would say is insane. Mm -hmm. Again, within a, a national park, you know, uh, is insane. Again, the impact on the landscape. Uh, we were told initially when this was starting to roll, when it was starting to roll out, that there was going to be a thousand fracking wells off the coast of western Newfoundland. You know, there's no, again, a, an excellent point. There's, there's really a deficit. There's no democratic institutions out there that actually represent the interests of the public. We found out that, of course, the Canada Newfoundland Offshore Petroleum Board is a regulatory, main, main regulatory agency, but it, it represents a single sector. Is a single sector approach, like you're saying, it always trumps. The other aspects of it, tourism, or just trying to maintain the ecosystem, that's always trumped. And, and they're out to quite forceful. And this organization, Canada Newfoundland National Petroleum Board, is responsible for, uh, for facilitating oil and gas development, but also responsible for environmental protection. We basically turn over our democratic responsibilities to, to the oil industry. Basically, that's what's happened. But things are changing. And, but the point is, what can we replace it with? And what some of us are starting to see is that we do need a new kind of a system. We do need some sort of a, an ecosystem-based, integrated, multi-sector, not something dominated by the oil industry, to look after our interests in the Gulf of St. Lawrence and Western Newfoundland. That, ha that has to be created. So what do you think in terms of, uh, uh, Stephen, the, uh, in terms of the possibilities of, of, of that kind of a, of a system being put in place, like a, a marine, uh, ocean marine, ecosystem-based management plan that really does consult with people and communities and engages the, the provinces and the federal government. I know there's all kinds yeah. of other agendas out there, but I, I don't see any other. It's, there's no hope. Cause yeah. Well, I, I guess for me, thank you. The fact we're having this conversation, is, is, I think, is, is, is good. Uh, I spent a lot of time in New York and New York State, and initially they decided they were going to go for it, or the governor was going to go for it, because public opinion seemed to be on side. And then the combination of the organic farmers and then people who were concerned about the, the, the water in New York uh, City uh, turned it around. I mean, I, I don't know what the solution is, but my sense is that there's a lot of frustration because people can't contest in courts because political courts can't be contested in courts, that they're being shut out. There's, again, a kind of an executive domination, um, almost abuse of power. And I think in, in whether we're talking about Canada or we're talking about the United States, there's a sense that we need more public space that we need to have that kind of conversation where we need to have different interests coming together in the same place 
and share their perspectives and come up with, with kind of common ideas in terms of what needs to be done. But my sense is, again, this is driven by some very powerful interests. Um, and there, there is, a, again, a sense that it needs to be done for whether it's U.S. foreign policy or, or other considerations. But I think what is being shut out are, are the, is the general population. And I think, I don't know what the, the solutions are, but there's a sense that we need to create regulations or institutions um, and deal with the democratic deficit. And it's not just shell gas production, but I think this has kind of become uh, an issue which has mobilized in part because people care about the water and they care about the community. Okay. <laughs> Uh, just briefly, I guess, I mean, one of the things we have to do is, is vote with our own carbon usage. I mean, if we're really interested in, uh, in, in, in carbon transition, we have to think about it uh, individually, uh, individually as well. I mean, the, the world petroleum uh, consumption continues to, to increase. Probably all of us in the room are, are, are part of that, and we have to think about ways to, to change it. If, you know, this stuff, if, if we want to use hydrocarbons, this is happening in somebody's backyard. Um, there are a lot of nice places out there where a lot of these things are, are going on. And we have to have serious discussions about, again, what we want from those landscapes and, and, uh, and how we want to produce energy. Can I just say one more thing? I know you're <laughs> keeping on time. But, but my sense when I was in D.C. and talking to some of the people who are, who are considered right wing in the various institutes, they are also talking about social life issues. That they, they themselves have come to understand and appreciate they need to create different types of spaces in order to engage or involve the communities themselves. And so I, I think shale gas production in particular has changed to a certain extent how people are thinking about regulations and, and, and the need for real communication. Can you hear me? Uh, okay, I, I touched on this, I think, last week uh, when I spoke. Uh, and, and it's the idea, and I think, uh, Michael, you touched on it when you said that we can't think of oil from separate from everything else. In other words, we can't talk about banning fracking in, in a vacuum unless we think about the other things that we want, right? So if I look at Western Newfoundland, where I live now, if we're going to say we don't want fracking here, we can say we want, we want a, a stronger focus on biofuels. For example, there was money put in a couple of years ago to pellet plants and so on, but that, that extra push, that extra paradigm shift to get people using that carbon neutral fuel was, wasn't done there. Uh, firewood is carbon neutral. Uh, in Newfoundland Lab Labrador, we can't hook up solar cell and sell and put power back onto the grid, right? We have a big racket right now over Muskrat Falls, which has a footprint, but is sustainable. So I think part of the conversation, when we say we don't want this, parallel to it should be we want this. Now, the lady last week from PEI, she said, well, you know, this, this is an energy policy, right? A provincial or a national energy policy is too far down the road. But my thinking is it has to be done parallel, right? So we pound our fist today here to, to ban the fracking. But on the other hand, we have to say we want this. And a lot of the stuff that we want, this we want this, creates jobs, right? Right? Money is coming in. And it's sustainable. And it has a very small footprint on the environment and on the landscape. So just maybe uh, the panel, maybe just talk a little bit about the bigger picture, right, that we kind of got a little snippet of at the very beginning. Well, maybe more for everyone else. That's a good place to start. Hey, societally, we're not very good, I, I don't think, at making trade-offs. Um, we like more of everything. Um, and often that, that conversation about, well, if we're not going to do X, then what does, what does Y look like? What are the, what are the actual, what are actual um, trade-offs that have to be made to do that? And I think that it, it, in a lot of ways it links to the last question too about, about what we really want from, uh, from landscapes and where it makes sense to do some of these activities and where it makes sense to have a focus on, on a different suite of activities. Um, and then politically, I guess, um, the other part I think that was implicit in your question is there is an unfair playing field out there right now. There, is, um, there are disincentives to making some of the switches uh, to some of these other energy sources or incentives um, uh, to using existing, existing ones. Some of, them, some of those things are, are relatively benign just because we have the systems in place. Some of them are more, uh, are more focused on, on privileging some, some industries and some interests over, over others, and, and that's, that's one of the things that has to change.
I guess my biggest concern is silo-based decision making um, and the lack of interaction or interfacing. So we, we need more uh, conversation across energy sectors. Uh, we also need more conversation across jurisdictions. We also need to have conversation in terms of those who are actually implementing as opposed to who are making the rules. So in the United States you have you know, some of the national rules are set, but it's up to the states to implement. They may not have the capacity to actually implement or the political will to implement. But I think in terms of the energy sector or jurisdictions, we need common spaces. We need to be talking about common issues or problems as opposed to competing with one another. We need to bring environmental issues in with energy issues. But we don't have those kinds of structures or processes within North America, and we've gutted them. And I think that's the challenge and that's the problem. Dan Marceau, I'm from Rocky Harbor. Um, I'm involved with the, the Fracking Awareness Network. And I must say that everything we have heard tonight, all I can say is yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, one of the worst things that has been happening over the last two years is people have been divided and they have been debating the small points. They've, they've, they've been, they've been challenging each other on, on, you know, is it jobs versus health, is it this versus that, and we're, we're, we're being drawn so deep down in the trenches that we're forgetting the ability to really look at the, at the bigger questions and to look into the future, and it's very encouraging, you know, to hear this discussion about how we become the future that we want to live and the future that we want to pass on. And I don't really have a question to ask. Um, except to say, I mean, I hope this is a discussion we continue tomorrow in in the forum. Um, if there's a role that that you know, Memorial and Grenfell and the Harris Center and Western Newfoundland is going to play, you know, maybe it is that we 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 try to kind of shake off those shackles of always having been the drawers of water and the hewers of wood. I mean, those are the resources that we have sold off time and time and time again, and we have traded off um, for what we thought were was some kind of viable future, and in fact, it wasn't. And so now let's let's move beyond that illusion and encourage people to have that that bigger discussion. Well, I think one of my experiences at Memorial over 30 years working on, you know, projects like Coast Under Stress is that we're trying to create an interface between experts and citizens. And, you know, it's not, we need expert knowledge, but we also need community knowledge. It needs to be a combination. We also bring in decision makers. We need to create that kind of, you know, communication, create the forums, create the space to allow that. And the Harris Center facilitates that kind of conversation. I mean, I learn a lot more from communities than I learn about from, from other experts. Um, and you, that gets part that becomes part of the narrative. So we need these these kind of this, you know these conversations. We need a discourse. Um, and I think the challenge or problem is that in many in many ways we're, we're losing that. Um, and I think that needs that needs to be something we need to rethink. And and then just really briefly, it, it's tough to do proactive strategy kind of kind of work and thinking when you're reacting to the latest development proposal. And uh, what happens is that, that the and you've seen it the same the same people come out to the same same public meetings and it and it wears you down and it's hard to be against stuff all the time as well I mean when you want to be proactively engaging in what futures look like it's tougher to find those uh, those forums for all the reasons that Stephen talked about but I think we need to find those kinds of uh, those kinds of places to identify those where do, what do those trajectories look like where do we where do we want uh, want to go. At the same time, keep an eye out for those things that you might have to, the brush fires that you might have to deal with, but not get completely stuck in that. My name is Ian Simpson. I live here in Cornerbrook. I've lived on the West Coast for 53 years. My question really is on health, which is the area I'm in. And when I was asked to look at the health aspects of this some four or five years ago, I was totally um, non-committal. I have to tell you that over the years, I've become much more anti-fracking from what I've been reading in the, in the journals. 
And about two years ago, um, I was reviewing perhaps 40 or 50 different scientific journals. I can't review them all now. In the last four months, they probably tripled what was there before, as you in, uh, indicated, Michael. The problem is health is not at the forefront, and yet when we're talking about environmental aspects of what's happening here, we seem to forget about what's happening to the people. There's been no studies done. The American Public Health Association two years ago bemoaned the fact at their annual general meeting that they weren't at the table, that they were left to pick up the bits when the fracking went on and, and, and look after the problems. There's been lots of studies coming out r recently that indicate there are health problems, but we're not talking about them. We're not analyzing them. And the best came out in the New York study, thanks to the concerned health professions in New York. I think New York had a little bit of a, a, a heads up two or three years before when their Department of Energy did a very big research project. And right at the back, <coughs> and they weren't didn't doing a health assessment, they said, there will be a lot more health problems in upper New York. There will be more silicosis because of the dust. There will be more COPD and asthma. And eventually, there will be more cancer of the lung. And they, th that is black and white. We're now seeing a lot more at a much lower level with children and infants and babies in terms of what's happening with the very low levels around the gas wells in Colorado, Utah, and other places. Why, have the, why has there only been one health assessment done in all of the states in Canada, and that was the recent one in New York State. So my question is, why is that, oh, why has this been a missing? And my suggestion is that you important people with important positions should be pushing for a, a full, a comprehensive health assessment for every operation that is planned in fracking. And that would be my wish and recommendation. And my question is, why hasn't it happened? I guess, I guess I come back to my health background. I think part of it has to do with the fact that we don't spend as much as we should on health research in the area of public health um, or environmental health. Uh, so there, we tend to focus on other things. And again, part of it has to do with power. But there are, I think, from my travels, people who are in the health field who are actually looking at it. In New Brunswick, for example, there was a report that was done with shape or influence that. But certainly in New York, and part of it has to do with capacity, I suspect, in terms of New York is kind of the you know, the center of the world in terms of, in terms of research and, and, and so on. But I think there is a, a really important piece, and there is a need, I think, for making that a priority. But when I did the uh, report on citizen engagement for, the, uh, for Romano, um, most of the research is biomedical. Um, so there needs to be a shift, I think, in terms of understanding the outcomes associated with the water we drink and, and, and public health generally and, and, and prevention. Um, but that's, again, part of it has to do with power. There are so many things to try to track. We could be having this same discussion about uh, fire retardants, um, household chemicals, um, urbanization, the, the, the amount of pollution in, in urban environments. I think the, uh, one, of the, one of the things that overall in health, uh, not just human health, but environmental health and monitoring is what are the key things to try to, to track? We, we can't even come close to keeping track of uh, of all of these, how do we pick the ones that, that seem to be most important? And generally what tends to happen is we wait until a problem emerges. And if there are increased cancer rates in a particular area or childhood asthma, then it, then it creates a focus and, and, and we get some, some direction there. But again, on the proactive side, um, it's just been, there's, there's just so many of these to try to keep an eye on. I think that's part of it. Even when we met with the ranchers, there, there, there's a sense that there are things or challenges or problems, not only with the cattle, but the, but the people themselves. And I think for the doctors who are concerned, uh, they don't have a lot of time to kind of reflect or, or to, to produce the evidence in order to, to really fully understand and appreciate what is taking place. So I think part of the challenge may have to do with the, the rise of rapid kind of change in, in terms of fracking activity and, and some of the concerns surrounding that. This is a problem because the um, very recently in Queensland there was a, a public uh, there was a, a research done. The problem was the com the complaints about the health problems were almost ubiquitous in this area that was was was, was being fracked, and they, they sent a complaint into the government and the medical officers of health never visited, got somebody to do a report and issued the report that said there's really no problem, probably about 60 pages. So a GP did her own work, and she went around every single household in these communities. She asked about their health status before and afterwards, and she produced this graph 
which is very dramatic. And the big things that come out are exactly the same as Pennsylvania, everywhere across the states. Profuse nosebleeds, severe headaches that go on for weeks on end, neurological problems, symptoms, not necessarily disease yet, which have been ignored by our profession, my profession. And I was delighted to see you across appointed to the Department of Health, uh, <laughs> Stephen. So perhaps we can look at getting a database for some of these communities, if they're going to be fracked, I hope they won't, so that there's something to go on to go back. Because every time people complain, they're told, no, no, that, that was there anyway. It's no bigger than it was. The most recent one was, uh, that I read was in Utah, where a, a, a midwife described increasing from one in 100 newborn babies that were dying and being buried to one in 15 last year, over the years. And it was shrugged off by the Department of Health. You know, uh, I've done enough. Excuse me for sitting down. <laughs> uh, kind of where to start. Um, I'm a mining engineer. I'm a geologist. I'm uh, director of Black Spruce Exploration. I'm a former chairman of the board of Ryerson Polytechnic in Toronto, so I understand the academic side. And I was also chairman of the Environmental Committee of the City of Kawartha Lakes, which is about twice to three times the size of the city here. But I've been here since October a year ago. And one thing we haven't talked about is the geology of Western Newfoundland and where are you going to frack? If somebody thought they'd be doing a thousand fracking here, that's not the case. So not the case at all. So yeah. And so, you know, I, I, I mean, we're here actively exploring. We're not doing fracking, and we said that from the beginning. But it's a, it is a, an, an issue, fracking, that is extremely large. It is an industry for each pad. And the results of trying to, I'm going to say, bring fracking, which is about 2002, maybe to 2004, to the present day, to any particular cookie cutter isn't going to happen. When you look at the way we've been describing fracking with going down and, and going out, in the Bakken this year, they're doing 12,000 feet down, 12,000 feet out in 12 days. At Garden Hill, it took 11 and a half months to get 3,000 feet down through 2,000 feet of granite. And it wasn't horizontal. There's one horizontal well that I know of in western Newfoundland. It was 750 meters, and it didn't find anything. There's no... the places to even look at trying to do horizontal drilling. It, they're just not around. You've got a very complex uh, system, uh, which is, is all part of big continents dividing. And it's very, very difficult to find some place where you've got those nice, even Bakken, nice, even uh, 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 entities uh, for, for doing fracking. It's just not around. Now, I'll lose, leave my last bit here. What I'm hearing is you need to, at the university, start to work on something like this uh, in providing the forum to bring together the people here to be able to listen to their uh, concerns and to make it work, to make it uh, uh, something for all of us who are living in Western Newfoundland to be able to contribute. Uh, our thoughts, medical, very definitely, and geological, economic. You've got a falling price of oil. You're going to have problems here this coming year. I'll leave it at that. I mean, I started by saying I wasn't a, a geologist, but I did take a look at the geology uh, before I came here, and, and I agree, it doesn't look anything like the, uh, the the kind of horizontal layered formations that we're dealing with in the big plays or in uh, in the western sedimentary basin. It, it, 
it's, it's, an, it's an incredibly complex, uh, complex structure here. And th that's why we need those conversations because the geology is so different in different parts of North America that sometimes you have to manage the water, sometimes you can keep it underground. So again, it's a, you know, it requires a combination of technical kind of conversation or dialogue as well as community dialogue. And we, need, we need both. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Edwin Betzina. I guess my, my question is directed at Dr. Quinn. Uh, I thank you for a very uh, balanced uh, presentation on, on many of the issues. And my, I guess my question concerns the issue of climate change. Mm -hmm. We've heard, uh, we've seen many reports from international um, intergovernmental panel on climate change, um, calling for the, the need to do something about climate change, and also the recent figure given about most of the fossil fuels that haven't been tapped need to stay in the ground in order to avoid the uh, potentially catastrophic effects of climate change. And um, fracking for oil and gas has often been presented as a cleaner fuel than coal, but I read the uh, report that came out of Quebec uh, in 2000 and, uh, to four, um, 2014, December 2014, um, and that was the basis um, for a major study on the uh, St. Lawrence lowlands, saying that, and which really encouraged the government not to go ahead with fracking in that area. And one of the things they said was that the, uh, the especially the release of fugitive methane uh, from the fracking wells uh, and all the other, the, car the whole carbon footprint associated with fracking, you know, the, um, the trucks, the, you know, the fracking itself, um, all of that would offset, could potentially offset the greenhouse gas reductions that the Quebec government has in place. And so my question is, wh why, why are governments and companies, you know, proponents, shall we say, uh, in favor of fracking when, when there's so much evidence that fracking will really undermine our, our ability to fight climate change? Yeah, yeah, it's a really, it's, it's a, it's a great question, um, and a, and a probably a really complicated answer. The first, first part of the answer is that um, there's a lot of debate about fugitive methane, about methane uh, escape. Um, some of the, some of the, some of the projections are right now that some of these wells are leaking up to 15 percent. Uh, that is 15, 80, uh, you know, 85 percent recovered, 15 percent uh, leakage, and at those rates. Those rates, there's no question that it's a dirtier fuel from a greenhouse gas standpoint than, than just burning the coal that, uh, that we're currently burning. There are a lot of differences in those rates. They, they range anywhere from under 2% to 13, 14, uh, 15% leakage. Probably the more, the, the, so there's a technical side to that. Probably the, 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 the more real answer to that is a, is a political and economic one. Um, and Stephen mentioned that uh, this is largely driven by the U.S. Um, wanting to be energy independent and the kind of capitalization and the explosion and, and uh, uh, investment that went into the, into, into the in industry to make this happen and this kind of snowball effect to all of that. Really, this is not being driven by, uh, there's some rhetoric around this being a, clean, a transitional fuel, but that's not really what's driving, uh, what's driving this. Economics and politics is driving this. The U.S. foreign policy can be very powerful, and there's nothing like getting, getting the, the Republicans to, by you know, promoting American interests abroad and becoming more self-reliant. So again, it's not just domestic policy or green energy policy that's driving this. Ah, yes. Uh, name is Graham Oliver, port of port Bay St. George Fracking Awareness Group. And if there's media here, let it be known that an anti-fracker Gave us way to a person from Black Spruce, so <laughs> I want that on. Um, uh, I'd just like to thank you. You did a wonderful job in your presentation. I thought it was uh, very good. I'm disappointed when I do a 360 of this room and look around here, and I can almost count the people that are here, have been at many forums, and I know where they stand. And I see empty chairs and have listened to so much talk of people saying, this is being pushed by a bunch of radical people. They do not come to the meetings. They do not talk. Only by uh, anonymous names and comments. So I'm sorry to see them not here. But the big problem that we're dealing here, and after doing many presentations, I see is trust. Uh, 
a few moments ago you heard about black spruce talking about I'm not going to dwell on this about um, coming here and not going to frack well if you were here at the front edge of it it was we can't come in without fracking and that led to mistrust in regards to geology I agree with you hundred percent right here out of the scoping are the documents that are with the uh, government uh, review on page 32 you have reports geology more complicated variety of rocks Western Newfoundland reveals very few uh, features that are continuous um, alternating sandstone limestone uh, cannot provide any strong well-defined seismic reflections tilted layers steeply tilted layers are poorly detected uh, distorted layers difficult to discern predict uh, where uh, can't predict where one uh, layer ends and one begins so there's a lot of problems with the geology of the place um, and when I looked at those uh, layers of the Bakken or the Eagle Fort or or Chellis or, or wherever it was it's totally different than here and we know that we live in that area uh, so we're, we have problems with that and I got to move on right quick uh, the bit about uh, Green Institute green chemicals trust not there not going to get it too many faux pas made in the early beginning National Farmers Union against fracking Lethbridge kicks fracking out Alberta voices they're totally upset Cochrane doesn't want fracking if you look at um, one last thing is uh, water resources. We know what happened with uh, Abitibi. Danny Williams was going to be really smart, give them the boot, take over the place. $130 million had to be paid through NAFTA. We have problems now with uh, Bow Waters. Uh, Kruger Bow Waters owns Grand Lake or the rights to Grand Lake. Water is going to be a big issue. I guess my question is uh, NAFTA water if we have big or, uh, fracking developments here will water and NAFTA possibly be a problem like it is on the gas bay we've got a fracking company that's just sued small town because they wanted to frack in their water uh, shed area let, let me let me there, you had a lot in there um, <laughs> Uh, trust. Well, one of the things that uh, that our final report is going to talk a lot about is trust. There's mistrust from a variety of, of different angles. Researchers don't trust each other's data. Uh, industry doesn't trust academics to come onto their sites. Uh, one of the things that we found, for example, is that there are a lot of good data out there, but you can't get your hands on them. Um, and sometimes you can get them through freedom of information. Sometimes you can make a deal with industry. Um, but one of the things that we're pushing for is some sort of a, uh, a, a third-party clearinghouse for data for data management, someone to play a trusted middle broker. And I think there's a role for academic-type institutions uh, in there. Rightly or wrongly, um, if you look at the survey data, um, academia has uh, has at least more trust than than government and industry. Uh, not 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 complete trust, but I think there's some uh, interesting uh, role to be to be played there. So. So trust is huge. A lot of the issues that I think that we're seeing around, um, whether it's fracking or pipeline discussions, uh, is the public uh, mistrusting some of those big picture decisions. And the only place to engage is at a flashpoint, um, a particular project bubbling up um, or, or an issue. But I think it's a symptom of um, a greater sense of lack of trust of uh, kind of where the whole ship is uh, ship is heading, and if there's one thing that 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 comes out of our report and the other the other four groups that are doing reports on different parts of the system, um, is this whole issue of, uh, of of lack of trust from 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 multiple directions. There's a huge huge challenge with water for governance because there's so many different networks and so many different interests and so many institutions which are involved, whether it's in North America, whether it's in Canada, and it, you know, again it, it, they're competing. It, you know, so it's like the energy sector. We need to find ways to bring some of these different interests together, as we say, so we can have a kind of a conversation, but also research which is with, without bias. Um, so I think water governance in North America or within Canada or even within provinces is a huge challenge or problem because there's so many different silos 
whether we're talking about the federal government, which intended not to play a significant role in terms of water governance or management, uh, or, or at the provincial level, because you're dealing with you know agriculture, you're dealing with cities, you're dealing with municipalities, you're dealing with different types of industries, and so it's a, it's very complicated. But it requires a public space. It needs we need to rethink water governance. We need to improve our ability to manage a resource which is really significant, and we can't do it on uh, on the basis of kind of a silo-based approach. Uh, a competitive approach, because I don't think that really is achieving anything, and certainly creating suspicion and lack of trust. You mind? My name is Keith Cormier, uh, resident here in Cornerbrook, and I will. Uh, I do have a bias. Uh, I'm 63 years old, and I have two grandchildren, and that's where my bias is. Um, something that hasn't been discussed here this evening is, and 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 I spend a lot of time thinking about this because, as a, as you get older, you think about What's going on in your life, and, and where are we going as, as a human species on the planet? I will tell you that 50 years ago, when I was 13 years old, my grandfather gave me his cabin for a week. And a couple of me and my buddies went up on Deer Lake, and he actually showed, had to show me how to tune the wick on the kerosene lamp so it wouldn't soot up the cabin. And he showed me how to sharpen the buck saw so I could cut my own firewood. And he showed me where the well water was. And that was 50 years ago. And that's not a long span of time when there was no electricity, no nothing to where we are today. 43 years ago, I was forced to go to summer school because I was a really bad boy in the fall and in the winter. And in July 1969, and how many people have a smartphone on them here tonight? Can I show how many people? If, there, if you put four smartphones together in this room, you have more technology then put Neil Armstrong on the moon in 1969 and brought him home again. As soon as humankind thinks that evolution has become linear and everything that has been designed, developed, what our minds can conceive and do as a people, we as a human species become exponential. In 1940, IBM said there's used for six computers in the United States of America. It's not what we're going to do right now, and our thinking is right now, because we are impacted by right now. What I'm thinking about are my two grandchildren. They need a clean environment to make a good, solid life in this planet. And their grandchildren, and their grandchildren. What is between the ears of man can answer several questions for me. The first one is, do we need it? Do we need the oil? Do we need the gas? Yes or no? We can figure that out. If the answer is yes, what is between the, the ears of man can find a way to get it out of the ground safely. That's all I have to say. Thank you. I think, I think knowledge is socially constructed. So I, I think you know, we need to pay attention to that. We, we have an opportunity to set our own priorities to decide what, what, are, what are the outcomes that we would like to achieve. But it requires public space. It requires an opportunity for, for sharing perspectives to come up with you know, common ideas or common perspectives, even if we, we disagree. If we do decide that we're going to move in a particular direction, we need to decide what are the regulations, what are the kinds of things we need to pay attention to, what kind of skill sets, what kind of reports are, 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 are essential, what are the costs associated with that, what are the benefits. Um, we need those kinds of conversations, but we need them in a common space. We can't be making these decisions based on silos without really fully understanding the outcomes and, and getting community buy-in. Uh, I think we need, we need to rethink in many respects how we construct or how we reconstruct our own planet. And there was a number of ifs in your, in your question there. And, it, and if, is, if this is something, if the decision is that we do need this oil or, or some oil or, or gas, um, there is the ability for technology um, and practice to, to improve. And even this industry that's literally exploded on the North American landscape in a little more than a decade, it, it's unrecognizable. The kind of drilling they're doing in Penn Pennsylvania doesn't look anything like the drilling they were doing in the Barnett Shales in, uh, in Texas 15 years ago. They're recycling something like 90% of the water right now in, uh, in Pennsylvania. Some of these green uh, fracking fluids removed, removed completely remove that VTEC from the system. Um, so there are ways to do a much better job of what we are doing if we decide that, that that's a road we want to go down. Hi, my name is Colin Curtis. I'm actually a student at Vernful. Um, and 
one of the things that I'm you know, highly involved with, and I've had the chance, in fact, to talk with other students who passed Canada about, is where do we want to see our future going? Increasingly, we do not see it as being the fossil fuel industry. We understand that there are unburnable reserves. We don't see a future inside of it. What we do see a need for, and we talk about generating the uh, technology and the thinking, is providing the alternatives. Um, in fact, I believe uh, you mentioned yourself the problem of subsidies, which is a, a great and more complex issue. Uh, and you know, we're students. We study these things. We're, there's environmental studies students, environmental science students. I'm a history student. I just completed an essay that I handed in today on the problems with uh, handling of resources inside of a new plant um, and Labrador. And uh, basically, in many cases, allowing companies to come in and do whatever they want without actually properly regulating anything. Um, and overall, the problem with uh, historical ideas of progress versus sustainability. I've been asked, am I anti-jobs? Am I anti-economy? No, of course not. But what I am is post-sustainability. We need to look at progress in that light. What I increasingly hear when I talk to students, and this talks about the fear and the lack of trust, when I talk to students about climate change, and the students who maybe you know, agree but don't necessarily want to stand up and say anything about climate change. It's not that they think there's something wonderful about the system we have today or that they you know, see the potential of fossil fuels to do such great good. They're actually afraid. They're afraid of what will happen to them or what you know, the fossil fuel industry might say about them if they speak up about it. It's hard to because if you have a campus, for instance, that has buildings named after the fossil fuel industry, how are you supposed to have any sort of voice or criticism? I, I understand, of course, that you know uh, you come from the talisman chair and that you've had some personal thoughts about it and, and thinking about it. And I do understand that you've put critical thought into where is your position. But when you have things named after industries in an academic environment, it causes that problem. Um, this is something that I think, I only have 40 seconds, we do have to think about is we have to live with that world. And we are really the last ones who can act on it. Um, and our children and their children have to think in that world. So thank you. Uh, I guess uh, for a question, yeah. Um, yeah, somewhere in there, I forgot it. Um, for a question, I, I guess what I would ask is, do you think that there is a problem that we have within academia where we have seen, in fact, a whole bunch of power and control go towards corporations versus individuals and perhaps academics and, well, students. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, the question is d near and dear to, to, to my heart and one that I've, that I've wrestled with uh, uh, a lot personally. Um, and uh, in, in the end, I don't think so. Um, it's, uh, and maybe it's partly the province I come from. I, for example, uh, uh, things are things in Alberta are pretty rough right now, given the price of a barrel of oil, and um, whether money comes from the provincial government based on oil and gas revenue or directly from an oil and gas company based on oil and gas revenue, it's the same pot of money that's driving that. So I don't think that my personal opinion is I don't think it's so much um, what, you know where the flow is coming from, but those bigger questions, you know, the questions about um, if the if the IPC if, if the you know inter, intergovernmental panel on climate change predictions are right, then all of those projections I showed about 125 years of gas are really are really moot, right? And if we're if we're hitting that two and a half degree Celsius um, threshold in 10 or 15 or 20 years from now, um, we're having a completely different discussion. So the students that I'm working with, the people that that uh, um, that I'm seeing make a change are people who are making decisions. You know, when I turned, Stephen and I were talking about this. I think when we turned 16, the first thing you wanted was a car. Everyone mm -hmm. wanted a car. That was that. That's what you did. The students that I'm surrounded with now, at least in large urban centers, they don't care about cars. Mm -hmm. They're not buying cars. They're not getting driver's licenses. They're they're using if they're using cars, they're using car to go or car share programs or public transit systems. So we're starting to see, and those are the kinds of lifestyle shifts that absolutely have to occur if there's going to be a shift a shift away. Couple, couple comments. I think you're right. I think shale gas could be a game changer. Uh, it's a game changer because people are raising questions in terms of the kind of future that they would like, 
and I think they're contesting, which I don't think is necessarily a bad idea. And young people have to decide what kind of future they want, and what kind of you know society they want to live in, what their values are. So I, I think that's that's good. That's healthy for for a democracy. I think we've seen the cutting of science. I think we've we've seen the cutting of public institutions and public space, which I think is bad. Uh, I'm not saying that's driven by any particular company, but I think we're seeing the gutting of public institutions, including bureaucracies, and I, I don't think that's you know really achieving the outcomes that we want. And I think that there's a fear of social movements and mobilization and people who are who are contesting uh, you know kind of current institutions and, and current ideas. But I think even those operating within these institutions and powerful interests are also trying to rethink because they understand that they, they, they themselves have to make, make some changes in order to mobilize support for the current kind of their, their narrative or, or, or their, their priority. Matthew Connolly, I come from the gas and oil industry as a safety officer and a trainer and instructor to keep people safe on the job site. Since 1996, I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly in that industry. I've seen a lot of changes for the good as well, but not enough. I also belong to the Board of Trade in Cornerbrook. Good organization. We've got a policy there that deals with responsible economic development. We need to work together so that we can have that happening in our industry here. And we need to put more occupational health and safety in there. We really do. The industry has fallen down on that. That's my point. I'm also a veteran and a lucky Aboriginal living here. So I got a lot going for me being in my own home. I want it to be around. I want my kids to enjoy it. You want your kids to enjoy it. How can we work together for responsible economic development in our region? What's your thoughts? Well, I was short. I can make this. Uh, Gerard Curtis, the faculty at Grenfell. Um, I was thinking about the idea of social license and with regards to your conversation and where social license comes from. And the reason we're having this forum is not because of you're being invited here. It's not because of the Harris Center. It's because the Harris Center put on a pro-facking uh, panel, which was supposed to be neutral, uh, about, I think, a year ago. And it mobilized a lot of people here because of that not in favor of the Harris Center, but against what they had done. And I think what's happening with social license is I worry, you know, you're Talisman Resources, we know their human rights records. We know they do their Fracasaurus cartoons in Pennsylvania to hand out to kids to promote fracking. We know they have 305 violations in Pennsylvania, that they have half a million dollars in fines for fracking. We know that at Memorial we have faculty who cannot speak up because they're getting Chevron research money, and they're afraid to talk. So I wonder about whose social license you guys are speaking about. You know, this is the social license here. It's the people who push back and force the issue and force you to be invited here. That's social democracy, and that's radical environmentalism. I'll keep it short. Um, I'm an academic who's been at Memorial for 30 years, and I've never been you know, concerned about speaking out <laughs> and speaking my mind. Some of you probably see me on a number of occasions speaking out, so I've, I've never been constrained. Um, I've also learned a lot from the community, and I try to learn as much as I can about the community as, as, as well as the history. And part of the reason I became involved with this project is because it was about sharing information, which I think is significant or important to the larger community, um, whether it's their health, whether it's understanding what's happening within the United States, things we haven't paid enough attention to. So as I said, I, I have never been told or have never been constrained to speak out. And sometimes people wonder why I speak out as much as I do, um, because I think that is, that is our role as academics. Um, that we, as academics, I think have need uh, to speak out. And again, my, my association with the Harris Center is the Harris Center has always been very actively engaging communities and, and showing a fair bit of courage in terms of doing it time and time again. 
Um, so I, I'm not part of the Harris Center. I, have the, I don't have the, the, the pin. Um, but I do think they've played a significant role in terms of providing opportunities, providing public space so we can have these kinds of discussions. The link between uh, worker safety and public health, I think, is a critical one. I'm glad it got, got raised because that's, um, that's, that's certainly part of the community that we could engage a lot more with. The people working on these, on these sites, uh, on, on fracking sites across North America, they're the ones exposed to these things on a day-to-day -day, uh, day -day basis. And there are very few health studies being done on workers on site. And again, that's a community that is challenged with with speaking up those are folks that are trying to keep their jobs on these uh, on these on these sites and we could do a lot by looking at uh, long-term health of, of people that are exposed on a day-to-day -day, on a day-to-day -day basis and then just a final comment I guess and it's similar to uh, to, to Stevens I I feel like I have a lot of personal integrity in the kind of work I do I work for uh, for World Wildlife Fund and I'm actually chair of a board of an organization called the Mustakis Institute that does public uh, environmental uh, environmental uh, research, research in the in the in the public interest, um, and uh, and again in, in in me taking a position at this stage in my career that uh, that included funding from uh, from industry looked long and hard at, and I can honestly uh, honestly look myself in the mirror in the mornings and uh, and say that the that that. They've done nothing, uh, nothing, and in fact, are, are promoting our engagement in this project. And I think the report will speak for itself. It's a fairly hard-hitting report. Certainly, isn't a, doesn't paint a, a, a completely rosy picture and identifies key questions that have to be uh, that have to be addressed if hydraulic fracturing is is going to be something that uh, that continues.